Uh, just a few things to start. Uh, I, I agree uh, really pretty much with uh, Larry um, uh, in terms of the drivers of the U.S. economy. And uh, uh, we, we, we happen to have a big interest in the housing business, uh, which Larry was talking about. And a year and a quarter ago, we decided to start buying houses, uh, individual houses that had been foreclosed. And we now have, uh, we're now the largest owner uh, of houses uh, in the United States uh, with about $5 billion worth of houses. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what we've seen in the last year is in the markets we've looked at, you know, where we're purchasing, uh, the, the, the market was up 20%. Uh, overall, as Larry indicated, the country was up 10. Now, if you start uh, with, with a market that was down 35, and you say it's up 10, it's basically up next to nothing uh, uh, compared to where it should go uh, over time. And one of the important drivers there uh, is that houses are the biggest source of wealth for the average American. And as a result of the houses going up, uh, then people have more money uh, or have more of a perception of wealth which translates into uh, consumer confidence. So, so I, we can see as practitioners uh, that this housing uh, uh, increase is real. Uh, we had housing starts as low as uh, 500,000 uh, starts. It's up to 915,000. I don't know whether it'll get to a million five, but it's got a long way to go. And I, I think that's a real engine. The energy thing is sort of unbelievable uh, in the United States. And, and the impact long term uh, is, is really um, remarkable. We're having our auto business in terms of cyclical recovery. At the bottom of the cycle, we were making about 8 million cars. We're now making 15 million. That, that is a massive change. And technology, uh, which you all are familiar with here, uh, is, is a major part of uh, innovation uh, in the United States. And, and finally, uh, one thing not to be underestimated is our banking system, uh, which was really uh, quite beaten up uh, in 2008, is in terrific shape uh, now, partly because of the work that, that Larry and uh, Tim Geithner did. Uh, they really did a fantastic job uh, with the stress tests forcing the banks to raise capital. And as you can see in Europe, uh, which is about comparable sized in, in its entirety uh, to the United States, they did not do those things. Uh, and, and now uh, their financial sector is under such uh, pressure uh, that they can't extend credit sufficiently uh, to power uh, their economies. Uh, in fact, the U.S. Uh, banking system is, is under lent. In, in other words, the bankers want to put out more money, but people don't want to take the money yet. Uh, so that's a, another opportunity uh, for us to uh, uh, expand uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, I differ a tiny bit with Larry just in terms of the drag of government. We have a lot of uncertainty still from a regulatory point of view. Uh, people don't know what the impact is going to be of the health care uh, uh, implementation uh, and regulations. Um, in the financial sector, uh, they haven't completed the regulations, which adds a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we have the potential to go through uh, tax uh, um, reform or new tax uh, regimes for both the corporate side um, uh, and also on individual taxes. Uh, when, when, when you don't know what's going on with your taxes um, and, and you don't know if you're a lender exactly what, what model is going to impact you, uh, what happens is people become much more cautious uh, than they would do. Uh, and I think uh, it, it looks like it's going to still take even more time uh, to resolve those types of issues. Uh, and the longer that's outstanding, uh, the more difficult uh, it's going to be for us to grow at the kind of rates uh, that, that Larry's uh, indicating. Uh, but the strength of the economy uh, is clearly there. Uh, finally, because they have a little, you know, sort of please stop talking thing up here. Uh, in terms of the Federal Reserve, it's, it's very difficult to be in a position when you have 
two of the most accomplished people in the world, both Stan and Larry, uh, on the stage talking about what's going to happen with the Federal Reserve because everybody's got their own guess. Um, I, I, I found um, the Fed to be really uh, pretty remarkable, uh, you know, in terms of how they've handled the financial crisis. Uh, and if I've learned anything from listening uh, uh, to Ben Bernanke is that you don't want to do something too quickly uh, to, to nip a recovery. Uh, and we'll clearly stop doing these uh, purchases uh, of $85 billion, uh, a month uh, because that was meant to be temporary, not long-term. Uh, and as we're starting to get more momentum, uh, though it's still to be seen whether we'll get to the kinds of strong numbers that, that Larry was talking about, people in the markets expect that to change uh, in terms of Fed policy. The only issue is going to be when uh, and, and how abruptly uh, there'll be a move. Uh, I, I think the answer to that uh, will, will probably be, you know, sort of, it's not years and it may not be months, it may be somewhere in between, uh, you know, whether it's six months, nine months, I don't know the answer. Uh, I'm not even sure the Fed completely knows the answer. I would not expect this to be a shock treatment. Uh, in other words, they won't just stop, I don't think, uh, on one day. Uh, and say, we did our work, we're done. Uh, my instinct would be they would do something gradually because the last thing they want to achieve uh, is, is hurting the marketplace, uh, creating even more volatility, because at that point, then people start freezing up again, and their work, which they accomplished, will then start to become undone. Uh, and that's completely uh, illogical uh, for them want to have as an objective. And I think a lot of this is already in the marketplace. Um, uh, and the kind of volatility would come more from other parts of the world uh, than uh, the Fed, uh, per se. Uh, I'd, I'd also just comment uh, uh, on some of Ronnie's observations, and then I'll be done, uh, that um, uh, Europe remains a difficult place. We find that with the companies uh, that uh, we uh, own. Uh, and we're not expecting a lot, though one thing I have learned in, the, in my career, uh, which is over 40 years now, is just when you're not expecting anything, sometimes it happens. Uh, and uh, Europe may have uh, hit bottom. Uh, I, I, I haven't found one person optimistic, uh, and, and um, uh, we, we, we may have seen sort of the worst of it uh, my bias would be that it would be flat, uh, but it wouldn't be flat to down. It would be flat to very modestly up. Uh, and in Asia, um, the impact of China cannot be underestimated. China is the biggest consumer of commodities in the world, basically about half of them. Uh, if China really catches a cold and creates a problem, you will feel it all over the world. It's not about China. And the developed world, um, which has undergone enormous growth and is somewhere, uh, develop a developing world, somewhere around 35 to 40 percent, depending upon who's doing the calculation of the global economy and has been growing, you know, sort of around 4 percent or more. If China stops buying their iron ore, if China stops buy uh, buying their oil, uh, if China stops buying their copper. If China goes into any type of recession, uh, which I'm certainly not anticipating, if that happens, you better like really look carefully uh, at your economic models because my hunch is that the world will feel that much greater than anyone anticipates. Fortunately, the Chinese have a very strong system for making decisions. Uh, and when something goes wrong there, they tend not to be passive. Uh, they act very rapidly, they act decisively, uh, and, um, and that gets to have a good corrective result. Uh, economic growth of China of 7% is astonishing. 
because that 7% on top of an ever increasing size uh, of an economy. But don't forget, and I'll leave you with this one, uh, that China itself uh, is the 100th poorest economy in the world per capita. So whereas most people think of China as a rich country because it has $3.4 trillion of financial reserves, more than any other country in the world, with nobody close. If you're the 100th poorest country in the world per capita, then your own view of yourself is as a poor country, not as a rich country. So this also translates into geopolitical issues where uh, when we ask China to do certain things and they don't cooperate in exactly the same way, they're looking at the facts somewhat differently. So anyhow, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. It's good to see the president. It was a wonderful night last night, uh, particularly for foreigners. Uh, the spirit in Israel is really something special. Uh, it was on display uh, for all of us and for those of us who don't live here. Uh, it was a wonderful welcome and a fantastic introduction to the country. What you've achieved is really remarkable. Thank you.